Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so although, as people talked earlier today, Australia and New Zealand have quite an enviable reputation for border security and biosecurity, um, we do have a gap in our biosecurity process, and that is through long distance natural wind dispersal. Uh, and that has been found to be an underestimated and overlooked risk. And we have found at least five major pathways into Australia. Two from the north, one from the Pacific. There is a pathway between New Zealand, us giving them stuff and then giving us stuff, and also a uh, pathway from Africa, which is predominantly um, uh, a pathogen potential pathway, partly from the distance and the age uh, uh, that ha happens all the time. So I want to ask you to start off by asking you a question. And I want to say, given that we've got these five known pathways, what do you think, which of the pathways do you think has the highest risk? Or given that there is a new pest arrived in Australia, where do you think originated from? And I want you to put up your hand if you think it is in Africa. I want you to put up one hand, but then I want you to put up your second hand to indicate how confident you are in that response. So in this case, if you think Africa is the most likely point of origin and you're very confident, put up both hands, okay? So who thinks that Africa is the most likely source of a new pest, plant pest arriving into Australia? Indonesia, Timor, and how confident are you? Papua New Guinea, West Papua and Papua? Pacific? New Zealand? New Zealand? It's interesting, We've, I've asked this question a lot in a lot of different talks. There are two groups that nail it every single time. The first group is an Australian group, the NARCs group, and they are very confident that Papua and New Guinea are the main source of pests, and they're dead right. So they're both confident that they're coming there. They get incursions across the Torres Strait every year, repeated incursions. That's the most likely place for long distance winds. It's also one of the shortest pathways. The other group are the New Zealanders. And New Zealand says, what's your marine risk? Australia, and we're bloody well confident of it. <laughs> and they're dead right as well. Now it does go the other way. We do get some stuff, but the majority of pathways or natural dispersal wind pathways goes that way. So what we're actually talking about is a typical risk or of a threat of a pest coming in, and it has a number of different processes. So this is an aerial biota model. You've got to have uh, something at the beginning, and it's got to be in the right stages to, do, to get up or taken up into the wind currents. You've got to have a horizontal transport. It's got to survive that. It's got to descend land, and then it's got to establish. Now, there's a lot of unknowns in that, that potential pathway. We, in some cases, don't know where the pests are and what stages they are. We don't know the survivorship of them. And there's a lot of cases of we don't know the history or the area, whether the host plants are available in that particular area where they land, or their suitability and susceptibility to particular uh, pests as well. So for the purpose of this, this um, talk and the, the work that we've done has predominantly focused on is there a pathway there? Is it open? And can potentially insects or plant pests move along it? And so we'd be basically just focusing on that component. And we've then looked at this process of the what, where, when, and how. So what is out there? When can it potentially move? Where will it land? And how we can deal with it and that process. And so this is an example of the location of a number of sugarcane pests listed in their IBPs in um, the industry biosecurity plans, showing the locations of where they occur in the north of Australia. Now, there is a lot of uncertainty in some of these species. For example, there are a number of species that have just listed as being present in Indonesia. We don't know where. West Papua or Irian Jaya, there is a dearth of information that's there. So we know that there are pests there. The sugar, if there's any sugar growing in there, it tends to get hit hard but there's only two records of two different species that are present there. So there's a gap in our knowledge there's, uh, about this process. So we've just generally, again, focused on potentially is a pathway there and where will the pathway land in Australia. So when we look at wind trajectory models, 
and we look at when things could occur, we basically find in that from the northern pathways, we've looked at five years of meteorological data, when would wind be blowing from the Indonesian archipelago and Papua New Guinea across into northern Australia, and we generally find that that only occurs during the monsoon or the wet time from about December onwards through to March, April. So that gives an indication of when this pathway would be open. The other component is then, this is some examples. So we ran a number of different types of models, both wind parcel models and uh, uh, dispersion models, where they'd actually, wind pathways is just is a pathway there, just like a trajectory. The other one com uh, encompasses the amount of material that's in the air, its fallout rate, and whether rainfall or moisture affects the fallout rate. So this is an example of dispersion models, which actually takes into account rainfall events that could knock things out. And just some examples of if you had a point of origin along the Indonesian archipelago, and this particular date, what sort of wind patterns you would get. Papua New Guinea on a different wind pattern would blow into Parnam land. In this particular case would come across onto the, the Gulf Carpentaria, and another one where you get this funneling effect um, right through um, the Ord River area. Just showing that there are events that occur during the monsoonal period up in north. From the Pacific, we get uh, a different type of events. It's not so seasonally based. It's more atmospherically related. Now, we also investigated cyclonic events, and cyclonic events do assist with wind transport, but not to the extent that people are aware of. It's more likely the wind patterns before or after rather than just generally before. Uh, in terms of cyclonic events, if there is a cyclone or a deep, uh, low-pressure system there, you get movements of north winds. For here, you have a, a, a uh, depression here, and you get these events of taking material from uh, air parcels from, in, from New Caledonia to Queensland. This is an example of one from New Zealand, where you get potentially a, a high pressure here and a low pressure up there, and you essentially get movement from New Zealand to there. Again, in the majority of cases, it is from Australia to New Zealand. In contrast to the northern um, pathway, which we know happens during the, the wet season, these ones are due to particular um, climatic conditions where, and it's basically the location of the high pressures and the low pressures derive these. So now that we've identified what particular high pressure and low pressure systems, we've got sort of an indication of an early warning system for when things can blow either from Australia, uh, from New Zealand or from the Pacific into parts of Australia. Now it doesn't necessarily mean they will come here, it means that there's a pathway open. We still don't know the survivorship of a whole range of pests of how long they would occur. Most of these trajectories are running for about 200 hours, um, which is about um, up to about eight days. Um, we do know the environmental conditions in these sort of fields are quite feasible for uh, a, a pest, uh, an insect pest to survive. It's quite humid, um, it's quite warm. Um, humidity is around about 60, 70 percent in most cases. Um, temperatures around about 14 degrees. So there's definitely things that can survive for that period of time in this air column. So now I'm going to ask you another question. So this refers to, we know when, now where in Australia. So here I want to ask you this question. Knowing the sort of level of information I've just given you, where do you think the coastlines or areas of Australia which are most at risk from long distance wind dispersal? Again. I want you to put up your hand if you think West Australia is and how confident you are. So first off, who thinks West Australia coastline is the highest risk from long distance wind dispersal? West Australia, yep. Mark, West Australia. Who thinks the Northern Territory is the highest risk? The west side of Queensland. I'm fairly confident. East side of northern Queensland, the New South, lower Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, some, Victoria and Tasmania. We've done the analysis, we've looked at all these combinations, we looked them over a 10-year period up north and we looked them over five years for the eastern border and the winner is East Queensland. They have roughly about 50% of the time um, they have a wind pathway that could be open to them. 
that could be transporting material to it. So yes, for Queensland, closely followed by the Northern Territory. Fortunately for us Victorians, we're one of the lowest risks along with, um, for those in Barrow Island, one of the, the lowest risks areas as well. This is from these pathways. The African pathway can potentially bring in um, pathogens um, to, to southeastern, southwestern West Australia and to South Australia and Victoria and potentially even into New South Wales, uh, New Zealand. So how does this information feed into a biosecurity system then as an early warning or predictive system? This is quite an old map showing what was then disease, determined to be the risk areas for animal health um, in uh, northern Australia across the NARX area. The, the redder colours are the ones that are deemed higher risks based on human movement. So again, to put it into perspective, the risks of material coming in via human either accidental or deliberate is by far a greater risk than natural dispersal by an order or two of magnitude. So if you're going to worry about something, first worry about the human risk of bringing in material. That has some ways been already been managed. The unknown, which hasn't really been managed, is this thing about long distance wind dispersal. And so some of this, some of our data that we're producing already is being used by people like Belinda Barnes to update their surveillance strategies in terms of how much allocation of resources is based should you do it for animal health on what's called portfolio theory. So they're using both the records from the human movement but also our wind dispersal pathways to update some of the things for plant health. So what can we do about it? Well, we can't stop the insects or the pathogens or pests from other countries getting into the air column. So what can we do about them arriving here? And this is the only time I ever, ever hope to use Donald Trump as a picture of my thing. We could build a great big wall. It's not gonna work. <laughs> so what can we do it? If they do arrive, what can we do? Well, the existing technology that we use for looking at natural dispersal of pests in Australia is essentially the gold standard is a suction trap, a big powered suction trap. But if we're going to be looking in areas that are remote, high saline environments, high humidity, electronics is essentially going to fail pretty quickly. We need a low cost, suitable method of collecting material that is suitable for taxonomic identification. The existing practices that are used are sticky traps and sort of water combination uh, interception traps. Now, who's used sticky traps? Most of us have. For identification purposes, who likes using sticky traps? So we have to have to think of something better. Now, sticky traps are great, they're low cost, easy to use, easy to deploy, and they're very effective. But in terms of identification, they're not very good, they're very hassle. So in combination, looking at literature and everything, we developed two new types of passive traps that we could use, interception traps. One is a modified Macquarie Island trap that was used down in Macquarie Island for many years. Um, and we also called, we developed the, the Zealot trap. Now, Les Zeller, is he here yet? No, he isn't. He should be coming in very shortly. He developed a sort of cyclonic trap that uses this to, so it's a passive trap that points into the wind and essentially as the insects fly along, they caught, get caught and get collected in a material container here, which then can be easily used for diagnostics or for purposes without having to pull them off sticky traps. But how good or effective these are. So what we did is we actually trialled them in three different states for eight weeks with weekly sampling. And this is one example where we set, set up the traps, uh, four replicates, five different traps up in uh, Darwin at the Coastal Plains Research Centre. Many thanks to uh, the NARCS crew and New Northern Territory staff for helping us with this. And we monitored them for eight weeks. We got eight weeks worth of samples, weekly samples coming down, and we sorted them down into order. And we were basically seeing as this, are these new traps almost as good or as good as the existing trap, trapping techniques that we're using for passive, passive traps, the sticky traps and the combination traps. And essentially what we found was, yes, they are pretty good. Irrespective of the environmental conditions that were happening at the traps, the traps did catch a range of insect species. Now, 
The one that stands out is the combi trap, which caught a whole range of things. That's the combi trap is this one, which is just an interception trap. Anything that comes along, hits it, falls in, including um, wasps, beetles, grasshoppers, crickets. Um, in one case, I think we got um, a gecko in here, a frog, um, this sort of thing. The, the general feeling is that they are catching the same, roughly the same number, cumulative number of, of the key species that we're looking for. There was one sort of anomaly, uh, which happened in which the zealot trap here, and that was, um, and Kyla had the unfortunate thing about doing this, about counting this. One moth had laid 800 eggs in the funnel of the trap, and 800 first instar larvae got blown into the trap. And uh, that's why this is at a slightly skewed. But the, we got the same results based on whether it was in Cairns or Victoria. Again, in Victoria, the combi trap, this water interception trap, caught a whole range of big stuff that we're not particularly interested in, not going to be used in long distance wind dispersal. Crickets, grasshoppers, um, uh, big stuff that was actually there, a whole range of European wasps and bees as well. Well, these ones did very, very similar. Probably the only noticeable difference that we got was that potentially the, the, the zealots and the Macquarie's may not catch as many thrip species as the uh, sticky traps. Probably that was the only real thing that came out about it. But what does that mean? If we, so now we're looking at, we've got the what, when, and how we're going to manage it. But what would that mean in terms of if we set up a whole range of traps around the coastline and the high risk areas, what would that mean? Well, the basic thing would be flooded with samples. And as it was with us, we had 500 samples roughly over that eight week period, and it took us months, well, mainly Kyla and Daniel and stuff, to actually count these out. Now, if you set up a, a good um, monitoring system, you're gonna get a lot more than 500 samples coming in. So there has to be a better way in which we can actually um, look at taxonomic identification of these where we're looking for rare events or the unusual things. And this is where Mark Blackett's work comes into it. Now, unfortunately, Mark Blackett can't, uh, can't be here to give his side of the talk, so I'm gonna to have to talk about something I have very little knowledge of, and that is essentially uh, molecular uh, diagnostics. And so Mark has basically said there's really a couple of, there's a numerous techniques that we can use for search, essentially taxonomic identification, everything from taxonomic expertise of identif identification through microscopes, molecular, DNA barcoding, and qPCR. And his idea was how do we manage to do bulk sampling or bulk analysis of a lot of material with high degree of accuracy without them having to rely on high level of taxonomic expertise. And the winners were essentially the DNA barcoding, qPCR, and metabarcoding, where we can get high output, high throughput, with the ability to identify rare events. And so within the project, we also looked at how, how good this method is at picking up these rare events. And as an example, this is how sort of like next-gen sequencing or metabarcoding work, is that you get a sample of a whole range of insect species, um, you amplify the genes of interest, you get your sequencing barcodes, you then have a computational uh, ability to sort out which, which species are present. And that gives you ability to rapidly progress a whole range of species at once to see whether they're present. It also gives you the ability to give some idea of the abundance of each of those species. And in this particular instance that Mark, uh, Mark Blackett wrote up, they had different types of mosquitoes. There was only one mosquito of one particular species and that actually was um, a vector for Ross River virus. And in amongst, I think it was 100 or 1,000 individuals with one um, species that could identify that that species was present and it was carrying Ross River virus. So in that case, it had quite a degree of accuracy. We then wanted to see how good it was in terms of looking at a hemipteran base. So we then seeded different numbers of insects, 100 insects with one individual or one in 200, one in 500, one in 1,000, particularly looking at either trying to find TPP, to, uh, tomato potato psyllid or Russian wheat aphid in amongst a, a thousand other hemitron insects. And he said he, basically they can find one in a thousand uh, and, given it, and also give an indication of how abundant that particular species is within that group. 
And it was actually in one of the controls that he was doing, he actually found um, in one of their controls, which had a thousand, uh, a hundred different other insects, that they, or a hundred insects not including Russian weed aphid, they found that they got a false, what they thought was a false positive for Russian weed aphid. And one of the advantages of this next-gen sequencing is that you don't have to mash up the insect species. You can take uh, your um, solution from the mixture that these insects are in. So in that particular case, they went through their 100 insects, which they thought were all non-Russian weed aphid, and they found one small nymph in star of a Russian weed aphid. So there, in that particular case, um, the diagnostic was better than the person that put them in. So in that case, it works very, very good. So then, so this project has essentially looked at the what, when, where, and how of natural dispersal into Australia. We've found that we've got a risk calendar now. It's been actually been implemented in terms of uh, the far north Queensland for NARC's process. Um, we also got potentially an early warning system that we could do for the southern states. Um, Kyla has developed a template that industry biosecurity plans can now use for assessing risks of their pests for natural dispersal, so we'll update the IBPs. And we've also developed a show in how you can actually start to look at monitoring and managing all the taxonomic identification of specimens. So potential traps and potential ways in which you can analyze it. So this project's been fun to work on. It's had a great support from a lot of people, especially the industry and from NARCs. And also, it was a vision of both Joe Luck and Alan Yen. So, thank you very much. Thank you.